This week on Cruising New England. It all began in Springfield, Massachusetts for the iconic Indian motorcycle. This is a gathering of motorcycle enthusiasts, collectors, and historians. I'm Paul Minette, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Cruising New England. Today we're at the Museum of Springfield History for Indian Day. We're going to have a look at some fantastic motorcycles, and a little bit later on we're going to have a look at their gun collection. All this and more on Cruising New England. All my life, I've been cruising New England, meeting great people, visiting amazing places, and discovering wonderful classic and custom car collections, nostalgic automobilia, and so much more. Come on and join our adventure. I'm Paul Manette, let's go cruising. Closed captioning for Cruising New England on Nesson is being brought to you by New England Recycling, waste put to work. Cash for Gold, the place to sell your unwanted gold and diamonds. Where you sell your jewelry is as important as where you buy it. We at Cash for Gold are gold and diamond specialists. We will buy all size diamonds, gold chains, rings, bracelets, silver coins, and even broken jewelry. Often we pay two to three times higher than pawn shop prices. We also pay up to 90% of the daily price of both diamonds and gold. We are the original, authentic, family-run Cash for Gold and have been for over 35 years. Visit us at 527 South Broadway, Route 28 in Salem, New Hampshire. Your special moments are something to remember. For weddings, portraits, and special events, contact Sparks Fly Photography. Hi, I'm Jerry from Auto Rust Technicians. We've been welding and sandblasting and undercoating cars for over 35 years. If you've got those problems, give us a call. Hi, I'm Jim Grundy, your expert for old car insurance. For 60 years, my family's been insuring old cars, and for 40 of those years, we haven't had a rate increase. We believe we can save you up to 50% or more in your old car insurance. Did I say 50? You bet I did. I know some companies say 15, but I mean 50 or more. For the best rates and the best coverage you can buy on your old car, call or visit us online. I'm Dick Shappy and deal in the finest classic motor cars, cycles, and vintage parts to collectors all over the world, but we're right here in New England. Vintage cars are like vintage wine. Both get better with proper care and time. I offer a luxury experience that's by appointment only. So check out my website, classiccars.ws, or call me at 401-521-5333 to find your personal piece of history. So we're back, I'm here with Guy Indian Day here at the Museum of Springfield History. Yes, this is uh, an event that we have every year. This is our fourth annual uh, Indian Day at the museum. But Indian Day goes back generations. Uh, it's, it's been a tradition with Indian enthusiasts for, for many, many decades. But here at the museum, this is our fourth event, and we're really excited. We've got all kinds of motorcycles, vintage motorcycles, uh, to Indians' great history. The, the vintage motorcycles we show here are only motorcycles made in Springfield uh, during the great era of Indian motorcycle. We have vendors here who sell all kinds of motorcycle products, things related to Indian, and we've got all kinds of exhibitors showing some of the greatest motorcycles ever made in America. Well, I'll tell you, I can't wait to get going. Why don't we just get started? Okay, let's get started over here. Paul, this is Butch Bear, uh, who is Hi, our, spe or our official honoree today. We're honoring him because, of course, the Bear family is famous as Indian enthusiasts, supporters of Indian motorcycle, and just and experts on Indian motorcycle. And Butch, it's great to be able to, you know, have you here today to honor you for you for this great event, Indian Day. Uh, but also, too, we want you to tell us a little bit about the motorcycle you're on, and also about your experiences with Indian motorcycle. All right, well, it's, it's hard to do in a few words. Dad started uh, with Indian in about 1916. Uh, when he was a young teenager, he had his first Indian motorcycle, and he was it. 1916 is when he started. Yeah, well, I was born in 1927, 
So dad at the time, of course, I was the third child born, and dad married mom in uh, 1924. And he had a 1923 Indian chief with a princess sidecar on it. And uh, for each child, she was taken to the hospital for, for the birth of the child, and the child was brought home in the sidecar with her. And I was number three. And uh, this is... Uh, so you started from the very beginning, coming out of the hospital. You came, you, you came home I on an... I started instant. before I can remember. Yeah, I read. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. And then you ran a dealership here. Uh, well, my dad, of course, had a dealership in the basement of the Indian factory back in the 30s. Uh -huh. So I, as a young man in 1933, at six years old, uh, it was my connection. I'm, I more or less grew up in the basement of the Indian factory. So what are some of the motorcycles you've owned? What years? Oh, well, <laughs> when I was 11 years old, uh, we had a small accident on somebody else's cycle, my brother and I. So my dad decided it was time that we learned how to ride a motorcycle. So dad taught me how to ride a motorcycle in the basement of the Indian Motorcycle Factory building. And uh, from the junk shop in the back room, he gave me a 1927 Indian Scout which was basically just a frame and a gas tank and an engine and two wheels. So that was my first motorcycle. Well, I spent more time working on it than I did riding it. But I did learn to ride it, and I used to run it around the basement of the factory and out by the railroad tracks and back down into the cellar again. And so you were destined for bikes for the rest of your life, weren't you? Yes, I sure was. So shortly after that, he let me take a bigger, better one out of the junk shop. And that was the little 1935 Junior Scout, which was a little smaller bike than the other one was. And uh, I ran that until I was about, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years old, 14 years old, I think. And then I finally got my first 101. That's what I'm sitting on right now. This is a 101. But my first 101 was just a stripped down job. And again, no fenders. <laughs> but I ran that thing out in the backwoods for uh, several years. And uh, when I was 14 years old, the, uh, 15 years old, I'm sorry, that I had my first professional hill climb with it. And that was right here in Westfield, Massachusetts, in the Fritzies Motors Motorcycle uh, Club. He ran the event. And uh, then I got my first AMA card and I entered it as a professional. Wow, very young. Very young. Let me ask you a question. Do you still ride? Yes, I do. And what do you ride? I today? ride a 1930 Indian four cylinder for my daily runner. I've modernized it with modern disc brakes so it can stop. I put an electric starter on it so I don't have to kick it. And uh, I've just rebuilt another one for my old age, which I'll rapidly approaching. And uh, that's the uh, model like this, only model I modernized. And uh, that's when I expect to ride, be riding well into my 90s. And I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. A lifetime of Indian motorcycles. Yeah, absolutely. When we come back, we're going to have a look at some guns. All this and more on Cruising New England. Order a bunch of parts to get ready for the car show this weekend. And I got a hot deal, too. You think? Think again. Oh, man. Tired of back orders? You need NPD. With four strategically located superstores, orders are shipped direct to your door within one to three business days. National Parts Depot has quality restoration parts for Ford Truck, Mustang, Camaro, Chevelle, and Firebird. For your free catalog, visit NPD online or call toll free. Find out what's happening. Get up-to-date information as I travel throughout New England and beyond. To get exclusive information and behind-the-scenes photos, join me on Facebook. I'm Paul Minette of Cruising New England at McMulkin Chevrolet. McMulkin has shipments arriving weekly of the new C7 Corvette. People from all over the country buy their Corvettes from McMulkin Chevrolet to get the highest level of value and service. McMulkin Chevrolet always has over 250 Corvettes in stock in their three-story climate control building. Remember, all roads lead to McMulkin Chevrolet. Check them out at McMulkin.net. The Thompson Auto Group. When September comes, the party begins. Cruise on over to the Big E in West Springfield, Massachusetts, September the 12th through the 28th. Would you like to see more Cruise in New England television? Now you can watch Cruise in New England every day on our website television show. See past episodes featuring premier automobile collections, memorabilia, automobilia, and car shows. 
you'll see our visit with Charles Gould and his Matchbox Modus Microcar Museum, the Chevy Guy, John Broden's car collection and automobilia, and a whole lot more. Join us on our website television show at cruisingnewengland.com. Don't miss the Amherst Outdoor Antique Auto Show and Flea Market, Amherst, New Hampshire, the last Sunday of the month, April through October. Over 500 spots. Gates open at 6 a.m. with free admission. We're back from the Indian Day, and uh, you know we're in here in the gun collection. Everybody knows that uh, this was the birthplace for the Indian motorcycle, but this is the granddaddy for gun manufacturing, isn't it? Oh yes, Springfield really is the center of gun manufacturing in the United States. Gun industry in America started in Springfield back in the 1790s. This musket right here is a 1795 musket made at the U.S. Armory, literally a couple of blocks from where this museum is. Uh, General Knox and George Washington established the armory here in 1794, and we don't know what the actual beginning of the manufacturing was, but it was about 1794, 1795. So this gun is either the first or the second year of production of uh, armory weapons uh, in, at, at the U.S. Armory. Now the interesting thing about the U.S. Armory is it was not only a gun uh, center for storage of guns, they actually were making manufacturing guns and they were developing new firearms. So the guns used in the Civil War, the guns used in the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II were all developed, invented right here at the Springfield Armory. And in fact, the most famous of those, the M1, the famous M1 rifle that was used during World War II, was developed here in the 1930s and then manufactured here. Over three and a half million M1s were made here uh, at the U.S. Armory here in Springfield. That's incredible. How do you acquire these guns? I mean, this collection is so rare. How do you come up with the gun collection? Well, many of these guns were acquired directly from Smith & Wesson. Smith & Wesson in the, in the 1990s decided that this museum was the place to store uh, the, their fantastic collection of firearms. Many of them uh, one-of-a-kind prototypes. We built that, we built upon that with other donations from other companies. We've acquired guns through purchase, all kinds of different ways until we have one of the premier collections of guns in, in the world. Uh, this museum has more than 1,600 guns. We have over 1,500 Smith & Wesson firearms, the largest collection of Smith & Wesson firearms in the world. So Guy, what's next? What's next is the Smith & Wesson, the beginning of Smith & Wesson in this beautiful Model 1. Smith & Wesson started in Springfield in the 1850s uh, and became the premier revolver uh, company in the world. And this is their very first model. We have an example of their very first model here, uh, Smith & Wesson Model 1, developed around 1858. You know, Paul, in, in the museum, uh, when, we're, when we're handling guns, uh, it really is a white glove affair. Uh, these gloves, of course, protect the guns from the oils uh, from our skin. And so this is something that people at home, if they have valuable artifacts, should consider themselves using gloves when they handle their artifacts. So we're going to handle this gun here. This is a very special gun. Let me get it off the exhibit right here. There we go. Now this is a Model 1 Smith & Wesson, the very first model here. You know, and so they went with something that was small, very practical, uh, very easy to handle uh, for their first model. And boy, this is a you know beautiful example of those first. It looks brand new. Yeah, it, it, it does look brand new, doesn't it? Now, how many but, shots is this? Is this uh, a four? It, it, it's a six shotter, six. and we have many other of the early Smith and Wesson revolvers uh, on this wall right here. These were the kind of guns that uh, many of the people going out into the West used, including a Model Two. So we're talking about Wyatt Earp and the whole Wild West. Absolutely, right here. You're seeing it right here. Now you go down here, these are some of the guns that were developed at the armory during the Civil War. These are all Civil War rifles. And we're going to take this one off. This is a beautiful uh, Springfield Armory musket made by the armory uh, during the Civil War. This would be the weapon, I'll let you hold it here because this is really a fine uh, rifle. Uh, this would be a, the rifle that would be issued to anyone in the northern forces uh, fighting for the Union uh, in the uh, you know, northern forces during the Civil War. It was manufactured here at the Armory. Uh, the Armory manufactured hundreds of thousands of these, about 800,000 of these during the Civil War. How long do you think it took to load one of these? A good soldier uh, could get off about three rounds in a minute. And you had to be in pretty good shape 
to be out there on the field handling this because yes. this is a pretty bulky. It's, yeah, it's, nice and heavy, heavy rifle, but a very, very accurate, uh, really good rifle for a, a, a foot soldier uh, during the Civil War. Guy, thank you for letting me handle some of these guns today. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, very few people. I don't even handle these guns that often, so this is a, this is a rare treat to handle these guns. So I'm gl I'm glad you were able to do that today. Now we come to this section here, and we can see some of the guns during World War One. This was the this is the famous 1903 Springfield, uh, developed here at the U.S. Armory and used uh, by American forces during World War One. Here we have the famous Dirty Harry pistol uh, developed by Smith & Wesson during uh, the 1930s. And we have a picture right there of Douglas Wesson uh, showing the 357 Magnum, of course famous now as the Dirty Harry pistol. And there's a very early example. And then of course, here's the famous M1 rifle developed by this man in the picture right up here. That's John Garand developed what many uh, gun historians consider the finest rifle ever made. Guy, this is a must-take place to go if you're a gun enthusiast. Uh, when we come back, I guess we're going to go see a lot more Indian motorcycles. Okay, great. We'll be back right after this. Welcome to the Town Fair Tire Recognition Award Series. Each week we're going to be giving away an award to recognize a classic car owner throughout New England. I'm here with Jim Uliano. He's the Vice President of Marketing and Advertising for Town Fair Tire. Paul, Town Fair Tire is a proud sponsor of the Recognition Award Series. At the end of the series, we're going to have a Town for Tire Choice Award winner for the $5 gift certificate. It's going to be very exciting. Jim, I want to introduce you to Rick Grisalia, and this is his 1970 Chevelle Supersport. Rick, tell us about your car. It's fully uh, body off restored in 2011. It's a 454 LS5 4-speed, finished in bright blue Nassau paint. It's, I tell you, it's really awesome looking. On behalf of Town for Tire, I'd like to present you with an award and a gift certificate. Thank you. Get to Town Fair Tire. You always get free mounting, free flat repair, free tire rotation, free snow tire changeover. Drive with confidence. Nobody beats Town Fair Tire. Nobody. We're back. Uh, who are we going to meet now? Well, Paul, let me introduce you to Bobby Arnold. Bobby Arnold, this is a beautiful bike. Can you tell me about it? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, this is a 1942 Sports Scout, and it was put together by my uncle from a basket of parts. And uh, it's my daily ride. I ride every day. It, it starts on one kick, and uh, in corners, I can leave my Harley friends in the dust. Wow, it's an awesome bike. Very historical, too. There can't be many of these around. Uh, no, because this was 42, so most of the 42 bikes became military bikes. So they didn't have that many civilian bikes produced in 1942. But um, 
My mom and dad both had bikes when I was born, and they sold one of the bikes to uh, get a refrigerator, so. <laughs> wow, yeah, those were the days. Now, your grandfather was very involved with Indian, is my, that right? Right, my grandfather was Fritzy Bear, who at one point was the factory dealer here in Springfield for Indian motorcycles, and very heavily involved with the competition. Uh, Class C motorcycle racing was showing the public that you could race on the same bikes that you could buy at the dealership. It was a uh, win on Sunday, buy on Monday type of uh, sales strategy. No, mod no modifications at all? They would take the lights off and uh, pretty much take the lights off. They could might take the fenders off or chop the fenders, but um, pretty much everything else had to stay stock. Wow. And initially you had to drive your bike to the race, but eventually they, they laxed that a little bit. But um, that's what they raced on. They raced on these things. Beautiful bike and thanks for sharing it with Thank me today. Thank you very much. Okay, guy, who are we going to meet next? Right over here. We'll go over here. So, guy, who do we have here today? Well, this is John Batchelor, better known as Duffy. So, Duffy, where'd you get the name Duffy? It's my mother's fault. It's her fault all the way? Yeah. You have a great display here. Can you tell us a little bit about it? We'll start off with the bike. Uh, this bike here I'd had for quite a few years, and I always decided to build a replica of the bike that Ed Kretz had won the first Laconia race in 1938. It was a 200 mile race, and that's where he got his name Iron Man Kretz. And I made a copy of it, and I did it to sell, and then I ended up talking to Ed Kretz Jr., and he ended up buying the bike. Because this is the bike right here that I made the copy of. Wow, beautiful. Yours looks nicer than that. Well, his looked nice before the race. After the race, it was a lot dirty. Right, right, right. <laughs> now, where'd the car come into play? Well, I built a guy a 46 Chief. And, uh, all of a sudden, a year later, he had the car for sale, and I goes, Andy, I said, I love your car, and I ended up buying it off. And what is it, exactly? It's a 38 Chevy, but it's all 78 Monte Carlo inside it, so I can drive it like a brand new car. Well, that's the way you want to do it. It's 22 miles to a gallon. Hey, one of my favorite bikes that I see here today is the one over there, my kind of bike. Well, that is a very good friend of mine, Ricky LaPlante, which is a motor builder, and uh, poor Chuck Miles had passed away. We lost him. And uh, he had bought that off Chuck Miles, and that's an old wall of death bike. Running the wall, what exactly does that mean? When they run the wall of death, the, uh, they call it what originally was called the world of death. But then they end up calling it the wall of death, and they all ride the right way around. And that was a wooden track, all wooden, right? yep. Like a bowl, wasn't it? You no, know, like an old uh, silo from a barn. Yeah. What they made the first walls out of, were an old yeah. silo from a barn. Uh -huh. And then these people ride these things, and they're, <laughs> they're nuts. <laughs> they go around, no yeah. hands, they stand on the seats and everything. Oh, it's got a lot of miles on that one, you can tell by looking at it. It was running the wall and it was ridden hard and laid up wet many times. You know, and that's what those bikes were, they will work. Some of those motorcycles didn't even have brakes, did they? They didn't care, they didn't need brakes. Yeah. yeah a lot of the old races, they didn't even use brakes, they just connected them. They didn't even use them, they just hit the kill button when they wanted to slow down. Uh-huh. To slow the motor down. And that bike there, I mean, it doesn't even have uh, fenders on it or anything. You know, that's keep kind the of weight, dangerous. Keep the weight down. No, they didn't care about it. They just stripped everything off because the bikes crash a lot. The fenders got dented up and they threw them away. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Uh-huh. No. No, it's just some of the stuff we love. You know, I love Indians. I've been on Indians since 1972. Is that right? Yeah, there's just a mystique about them. They're just a lot nicer bike. I just don't know what it is about it. Duffy, thanks a lot for sharing the you display with us. have a very good day. When we come back, a lot more cruising New England. Hi, my name is Neil Murley, Murley's Car Care Center. We are Southern New England's Sunoco Race Fuel dealer. Save on Sunoco Race Fuel to right off Route 3 in Weymouth Heights. And good luck on the track. These are the faces of childhood food allergies. To these kids, it's not about the inconvenience of restricting peanut products and other food allergens at school or at camp. To more than six million of our precious children, it can be a matter of life and death. Help us keep all of our children safe. Learn to recognize allergic reactions. Know the facts about food allergies. Visit the Wood Museum of Springfield History in Springfield, Mass., home of the world's largest Indian motorcycle collection, and Springfield built cars like Rolls Royce and the Duryea. Check out Cruise in New England Productions' website. You'll see updated information about our fun car show series, including the Magical Mystery Cruise, the Circle of Champions, the Super Wheel Showdown, and the Spooktacular Cruise and Classic. Also subscribe to Cruise in New England magazine.
We feature some of the hottest rides in the Northeast, along with event listings and a whole lot more. Don't miss a single issue. And if you want more information about sponsorships, advertising, or personal appearances by Paul Manette, email us at cruisenewengland at AOL.com. In the market for new tires, there's only one place to go. Town Fair Tire. We beat anyone, any day. Online prices, we beat them. Wholesale clubs, other tire dealers, we beat them. No matter what the brand or the size, Town Fair Tire will beat any price, any day. And you always get all these services free. That's why nobody beats Town Fair Tire. Nobody. Name brands at discount prices. Town Fair Tire. We're back, and we're going to look at some more Indian motorcycles. Who are we going to meet now? Uh, this is Michael Bear, and this is the oldest motorcycle that we're going to look at today. Nice oh, to meet you. you. You as well. So what we have here is a 1926 Indian Scout. Uh, originally, it was a 37 cubic inch engine. This one has been upgraded to a 45 cubic inch engine. Now, why did you do that? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a little chubby around the way, so we need a little extra horsepower to get me around town. You You're know? my kind so, of guy. You know, horsepower, a little bit more horsepower is always better, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's a beautiful bike. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, here's a pretty rare aftermarket piece is the tandem saddle. So for your passengers in the, in the time period, this is a very uh, period correct tandem saddle for any, any make of motorcycle for that time period. Great size for me. Mike. Yeah, well, you know, you know, it gets a whole button there. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike, do you actually take this out on the street? Yes, this is my daily cycle. Right now I'm mid-engine rebuild on it. So if you can see, like I'm actually missing my exhaust on it right now, I couldn't get it on there in time for today, but this is my daily rider. Wow. You drive this back and forth to work? I mean, that well, type I of thing. I work at home. So oh, you work at it's to the coffee shop and to the local, you know, pub for dinner. You oh, know, it's great. But, great, great. Yep. And it's a great, great running cycle. Very nimble, very agile, handles fantastically. Way ahead of its time as far as handling goes. Well, it's a beautiful bike. Thanks for sharing Thank it with us so here much. today. I appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to see a lot more, aren't we? Sure are. Well, let's go. Uh, Paul, this is Don Scarp. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Paul. This is my kind of bike, the Black Beauty. That's it. You know, everybody says I'm the Black Beauty because all I wear is black. It makes me look a half a pound lighter. Right. But tell me a little bit about this bike. Well, this is a 1941 Indian four cylinder that uh, I found about eight years ago right here in Springfield. And um, it took about three years to get it done. And I'm happily riding it now. You know what? I like the story behind the bike. You said you found it here. Where'd you find it? Well, it was a, a friend of mine that told me where it was, and it was uh, been in dry storage at Liberty Heights section here in Springfield. Uh, oh, he bought it in the early 80s, and then I, uh, he was ready to pedal it, and I got it. Lucky you. Yes. So tell us what you did to the bike. Uh, well, luckily it was a complete cycle. Um, but just took it all apart and did the chrome and paint and just had to do the top end in the motor and uh, away we went. It's a show bike. Yes. It's absolutely stunning. Thank you. And it's a barn find. Yes, yes it is, yes. All this on Cruise in New England, a barn find. Well, I want you to thank you for sharing it with us here today. Paul, thanks for being here. Yeah, great. Appreciate it. Who we got next? We're going down this way. All right, let's head on out. So Guy, who we have here? This is Joel Castleman. Joel, nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. This is uh, quite a rig you got here. I see a motorcycle, and is this a theme park ride? <laughs> you might think so, huh? <laughs> uh, actually, that's called a Goulding Rocket, a oh, 1948 Indian. And Goulding was a high-end uh, sidecar company back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And when Flash Gordon came out, everybody in the country wanted to get in the rocket business. And they came up with this Goulding Rocket. It looks like a, uh, a amusement park ride, and they called it a rocket. It was their highest-end unit. And in fact, the chrome nose was a $15 option back in 1935. Oh, how much would that cost today if you could even find one? Yeah, well, that's the, the, the believe it or not, the sidecar's rarer than the motorcycle. So tell us about the bike. Uh, it's a 1948 Indian Chief made right here in Springfield, Mass. Uh, runs great, it's always been a great uh, runner, and the sidecar makes it a little more difficult to ride, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Well, I love the bike, I love the display. Hey, maybe I could get a ride on it. I'd love to get you in here, let's All go. All right, let's go for a ride. Sounds good. Hey, Guy, I've had a great time here today. What a show, and that gun collection was awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having enjoyed me. enjoyed having you. Hey, you ready to go? Let's go. I'm Paul Manette, folks. Until next time, I'll be cruising New England.